worst thing every young objectivist really hates, it's like fingers on the chalkboard, is to hear, oh, I read Ayn Rand when I was in college, you'll grow out of it. But the amazing thing is how many of us don't grow out of it, you know, it's, it's as though her philosophy in an important respect is something you grow into. The Atlasphere is a website with a networking directory and dating service for admirers of Ayn Rand's novels, chiefly The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. Now, the dating service arose because uh, some of the people who were uh, involved in our original discussions about the website were pointing out, you know, hey, a lot of people are going to want to use this as a way to fall in love. Uh, one of the open secrets about objectivist conferences is that uh, most of the single people there are, uh, they'll sit through the lectures, but they're really there to socialize and meet someone. And uh, I remember well that when I attended objectivist conferences, I wanted to meet my soulmate. So, you know, there's a distinction that you could make between people who consider themselves to be objectivists and people who are admirers of Ayn Rand's novels. And on the Atlasphere, I deliberately created the site to appeal to admirers of her novels because it seemed like a a common denominator that included more people with a, a, a broader, diverse uh, interests and uh, philosophical commitments, but who had one thing in common, which was their reaction to Rand's novels. I definitely think her novels provide the best introduction to her ideas. Um, they're easier, so they're more accessible to many people. Um, they're bestsellers over the last 40, 50 years, so obviously they've appealed to many people. But they also, they set her ideas in the context of the real world. And if you read The Fountainhead first, you're really treated to a beautiful introduction to her thinking. It's the way she came to her ideas. She was originally uh, very interested in the notion of how do people maintain their independence and integrity in the face of a world that demands compromise. And the Fountainhead is about that. And you read that book and you really, you get a personal in introduction to her ideas. Then you can read Atlas Shrugged and she, she shows how that same idea plays out in uh, aesthetics and romantic love and politics and ethics. And uh, by the time you get to Galt's speech, you've pretty much got it all laid out in front of you. So I think there are a few places where she really distills it down to a, a crystal clear formulation quite the way she did in Gulf Speech. Well, on the one hand, it's a intellectual climax of the novel. It's the place where the plot tension that's been going on through the whole novel is finally explained. You understand why the producers have gone on strike. On the other hand, it's the opportunity for Rand to lay out her philosophy uh, as a system for the first time to the world. The part of the speech that bowled me over the most and continued to impress me for years as I was rereading it was uh, her derivation of ought from is. And I continue to think that's one of the most valuable things that Rand did as a philosopher is helping people understand in a clear, lucid way how you could derive principles of what you ought to do in your life from factual information about the nature of human life. So she was identifying you know, requirements of biological life and how those lead to the need of a system of ethics and guidelines for uh, leading the good life. And that connection, which she outlined, I think first in, in Galt's speech, is uh, it's brilliant. You know, I've, I've heard philosophers complain that it's not rigorous or they disagree with it in one way or another, but I don't know anybody else who has provided for everybody a lucid, easy to understand explanation of why ethics is ultimately rooted in reality and in our nature as biological beings. As a novelist, she was doing something very radical in trying to portray an ideal human being. There, there are very few novelists uh, now, or I think you have to go back pretty far in history to find novelists who were comfortable with the idea that their, their role as an artist was to uphold an ideal Rand was not only trying to create that ideal, but she had enough of a good vision of what that ideal consisted of that often you can tell a lot about people by how they react to it. For example, some people find it hopelessly corny that she was trying to paint a picture of the ideal person. And uh, other people find the very idea of uh, a novel extolling selfishness to be uh, you know, just ridiculous beyond belief. 
when people ridicule Ayn Rand, I often sense that there's something at a deeper level. There's something about idealism itself that's a little uncomfortable to them. And in that sense, her novels can be a very useful touchstone for understanding to what extent do people share my belief that human beings can be noble. To what extent do people share my belief that thinking for yourself is really important? I find when people are uncomfortable at a visceral level with Rand's characters, um, they can still be good people, but they're probably not people who I'm going to be able to hit it off with as easily or as deeply. Rand's ethical teaching that I've personally found the most useful is, I think, a line from the introduction to the virtue of selfishness. She says, the basic social principle of the objectivist ethics is that every man is an end in himself. And it's a good razor, ethically, if you're sizing up a situation politically or in your personal life, to ask yourself the question, are we creating a solution here where everybody's treated as an end in himself, where their own happiness is the most important thing for each person? Or are we creating a situation where some people are expected to sacrifice to others, uh, where some people's interests are subordinated to others? Rand's ethical vision was really one where we, we want to create a win-win world for everybody. And that there shouldn't be conflicts of interest among rational people if you're using an ethical system where everybody's treated as an end in himself. When Rand was writing, selfishness was really a dirty word. You know, you almost couldn't talk about it in polite company. In the years since then, you know, we've had the hippies have grown up, the 60s culture has matured, they're now, you know, running the world. And selfishness, it's really different to talk about selfishness now. I think in our age, in contrast to Rand's age, it's a much bigger problem, people who are stuck on narcissism. I think one of the dangers of Rand's philosophy at this point is that if you're disposed towards narcissism, Rand's going to give you all the justification that you need to keep doing that, maybe even become worse. So in today's culture, I think it's important to point out that it really is about treating people as ends in themselves. You know, when you talk about selfishness, if you take that ideal to the extreme, depending on how you interpret it, you can end up with a lot of bad behavior. But if you take an ideal like treating people as ends in themselves, it's hard to go wrong with it. And I think if you really want to realize the potential that Rand outlined in her philosophy and her writings, I think you need to keep an open mind. Learn from a lot of different places, even in unsuspecting places like Buddhism. One thing that Buddhism at its best and objectivism have in common is a great respect and emphasis on fidelity with reality. And in objectivism, that fidelity with reality takes the form of logic and making sure that what you believe matches what's really true. So it's intellectual. And in Buddhism, the emphasis on fidelity with reality takes the form more of emotional fidelity. And um, learning to identify your own emotional resistance to the way things are. So the Buddhists have emphasized acceptance, meditation, uh, sometimes a sort of strategic mental detachment so that you can maintain more objectivity about your emotions and your thought processes. Sometimes I see Buddhism as a set of practices in search of a philosophy in an analogous way that objectivism could be seen as a philosophy in, sur in search of a set of practices for, for doing things like raising your level of consciousness, being more productive, having a happier life, having more harmonious relationships. So what would it look like if you combined the ideas of objectivism with the practices of Buddhism and the kind of personality that that creates? You know what that would look like? I think it would look like Howard Rourke. And I think it would look like John Galt, too. If you want to look at a, pace with, a face without pain or fear or guilt, look at Buddhists. Those are people who've learned, they've, they've learned to interact with their own mind and their own emotions in ways that lead to the kind of serenity that Rand advocated in her novels.